We have some important reminders here. And in the case of Jesus, who is God, who is Savior, who is Lord, who is Redeemer, who is King, his disciples are those who are diligent students, diligent students, compelled by love to learn as much about Jesus as they can to not just know of him, but to become and live like him, to let Jesus' spirit uh, mold their hearts in righteousness and, as we've implied in prayer and song, in preparation of his return. I think about 1 John 3, 2. 1 John 3, 2. That passage encourages us and instructs us to, in my words now, live like him now so that we will be and see him then. That's important. That's the, to the future. But let's look to the past, and I want to have a question for you. And just think about it in yourself. What was likely what motivated our responses to the gospel? What were the core motivating factors that uh, compelled you to put on Christ in baptism? What, we get, what, was, what caused that? Well, I boil it down to two assumptions, and they're certainly that each of us should have. You maybe could list more. But primarily, it was, was it not, our need for forgiveness. That was primary. And then our desire for the award or reward of eternal life. We wanted both of those things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus' Jesus's return is imminent, so it makes sense to prepare. There's part of that initial gospel response that says, get ready. I appreciate that today. But, follow me on here. As we mature in godliness, we learn that there's a priceless virtue and value of simply praising God, simply serving God for who He is. Right? Heaven is a reward for those who are serving God and fulfilling their purpose to praise Him in all that they do. That's a point of maturity. And according to Psalm 37 verse 4, as a consequence, a positive one of this, we delight in the priceless fruits of spiritual living. The Christian life is God's way, and therefore it is an attractive way because there's benefits to following. It's difficult in this world, but it is beneficial, and people see that. So there's every reason to follow God. This, however, is where our daily challenge comes in. Since we love the Lord, guess what? We pursue righteousness. That's our heart's desire for Him. And in the process of this sin-stained world, and we are a part of that in temptation's sake, uh, don't think that it's always easy to follow God's will in this world. A part-time Christian cannot defeat a full-time devil. If it were easy to always choose what's right, there would be multiple millions more Christians today. Our adversary is very skilled. He's an expert of evil, and he's very experienced and extremely effective within the confines of his condemned work. Our adversary is not to be underestimated for sure, and thankfully, thankfully, in the arena of the spiritual battleground for your soul, and that's what happens all the time, every second, even right now, your mom may be wondering elsewhere because he knows I'll have a message coming up that you will be blessed by, and he doesn't want you to hear it even though you're in the building. So he's very clever at what he does. In the area of the battleground for your soul, he is limited by human choice. Human choice. So the question is, what choice will we make? Satan and in his demonic forces tempt us to sin. We are to mature through those tests, yes. And when I say tests here, I'll say that God does allow tests, but he also makes his help available if we so choose that as well. But with the evil intent of Satan and his forces, it's with that evil intent through the method of temptation, temptation, that Satan works skillfully to deceive you back into destruction. And it is quite scary to think about this, but baptism, we know, drowns our old ways of life. It's to drown our old ways of sin. But it doesn't drown the devil. 
It is scary to think that Satan and or his demonic forces know the areas of your strongest desires and your greatest weaknesses. And accordingly, he baits his hook with just enough sinful seasoning to make you think or question to yourself if, if just a little detour back through sin would really set you back all that much. It's just one. Or, or maybe not even at all. I'll be okay. I'll be forgiven. <sighs> Such talks with the devil are treacherous because he's the father of lies. You can't believe anything he says. Even when he quotes the truth, it is misapplied to mislead. You can't trust anything the devil says. He knows, Romans 3, 23, that there is no such thing as a little sin, but that it also grows sin. It's, that way of thinking is just a trick that it's not really that important. He intends to keep you longer than you plan to stay. And, of course, take you further than you ever thought possible. That's the way sin is. But even the, that initial sin separates. Don't underestimate your strength either to resist if you're not pursuing Christ. And the sum of our lesson comes back to this idea. It is by his strength that we overcome. But again, Satan is so clever... We have to be that strong soldier. He is so clever that we have, how clever is the devil? We have all fallen prey to his techniques and tactics, haven't we? we all, we've all done it. We've grown into that accountable age where we have willfully chosen to go against God's will and pursue our own. He's clever. And yet, it's amazing with how skilled he is. He only has a few things in this world to pervert. What do I mean? He only works with a few things to steer us from God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, all sin, all sin is rooted in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So he perverts all of those, each of those, in order to lead us to sins that occur every day and that occur in thought, in word, and in deed. And they do occur every day. I want to make a quick, quick reference. Can't ignore it. Sins of ignorance occur all the time, every day. And so we praise God for being, and here's a term for you, mercifully gracious as we mature. Thankful for that. But without a doubt, no dispute, there, it's in those blatant temptations that our Faithfulness that our uh, devotion and our maturity are all put to the test. This is where it gets personal. That's a good thing. How has Satan learned to adapt his bait to entice you these days? How has he learned? It changes, it grows as you do. <laughs> a true temptation is when what would please us and the deceiver and the destroyer is in stark contrast to what would please the Lord and Savior. That's a true temptation right there. What choice will you make? And for many reasons, all the saints of old, the heavenly hosts, and the Spirit of God himself is advising us, warning us to keep that old person of sin buried in the water every day, die daily to Christ. And the answer or the reason why is because your new life, your new eternal life is still at stake. Colossians 3, verses 3 through 5. That short passage addresses this whole concept very well. For you died and your life is hidden with God or Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And now for our lesson's key challenge today. Therefore, verse 5, therefore, because of all this, put to death. Okay, he's talking to Christians in the present perfect. Keep deciding, keep deciding to keep putting to death your members which are on the earth. 
certainly he's not saying our physical bodies that God has created is inherently evil. That's not, that's a whole other direction, false idea. But what he is saying is how you live in this life, make sure you overcome sin. And he mentions a few of them. Overcome the temptations to do things like fornication, all uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. You take away those problems from planet Earth and you have a much, much better place, don't you? These are just a few common ways that pride and desire are sinfully perverted or twisted by the devil to get us to sin. And he mentions that all of this sin is idolatry. I know you've heard that before. You may wonder, how can any sin be idolatry? Well, here's the answer. I'm going to say it twice. Sin is idolatry because the Lord's will is righteousness. Sin is idolatry because the Lord's will is righteousness. And therefore, it is our choice which Lord we follow. That's how simple it really is. And the passage you heard earlier read, Romans 8, 13. This is so clearly explained. The choice is so clear. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So don't be fooled. And this is my words now. Don't be fooled. Each temptation is another attempt to lead you to death. But we're told if you live by the Spirit and godly things, if you live by His truth, you will live. Why? How? Because you are putting to death the deeds of the body, the sins. You're overcoming temptations. So to paraphrase Romans 8, 13, those who serve sin will be overtaken by death. Those who serve Christ will be victorious in life. Death is swallowed up in victory. And after all, it's by His blood that atone for sin. It's by His power that freed us from the consequence of death and it was itself conquered. So, we pursue Christ for all these reasons. We pursue Christ and as we are, we are in fact depending on Him. We pursue Christ, we depend on Christ. His power, His wisdom aids us in overcoming or increasingly resisting temptations from the devil, the devil that I do not want to fight on my own strength. There's just no way I want to do that. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and, uh, and through 18. Let's enjoy the reading of this great passage in light of all that we've discussed so far. It teaches us obviously to rely on Jesus in our time of temptation because he can help like none other. But why? Verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Okay. Christians are humans. He himself likewise shared in the same Okay, Jesus, our Lord, our God, the Word of God, experienced humanity. It's now a level of fellowship that we have with the Lord of life. It's not that we rose up to that occasion as much as he, in Philippians 2, humbled himself to experience that with us. And that was wise, necessary. The Word of God became flesh to atone for our sin, and it continues that through death... He might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And here's the blessing for you and I. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What is that saying? Were it not for Christ, we were in a hopeless, fearful, dreadful state of slavery to death. But not in Christ. For indeed he, Jesus, does not give aid to his angels. He doesn't need to do that. But wow, he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That is spiritual Israel. Those in Christ who have been added to the church. Those in the Lord. He gives aid to us. Verse 17. Therefore in all these things he had to be made like his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation, that's a, I like that word because of what it means. It's not often studied. He took our penalty. He took our penalty 
He took the blow of God's wrath for my sin. In verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted. Ah, here's where we are. He is able or able to aid those who are being tempted. If you care about the Lord, that's encouraging to you because you know how, how much of a struggle it is. I want this, but God says that. Ah, help me, Lord. Jesus not only died to give us victory over sin, but equips us to conquer temptation. And each temptation is a threat to spiritual living. So I'm thankful this is how we overcome. I love that song, and I know you're singing. I hope you listen to it after the services as well. This is how we overcome, people. To this point, I've just, we've all wanted to remind you of just how important sin is to avoid, how serious it is in God's eyes, and to conclude our time with a little basic training course using spiritual weapons that God himself provides to help us overcome temptation. There's a principle that the course is based in, and it's this. The key to victory is our faithful, yielding, active, obedient, determined reliance on his strength. His strength. Not mine, not yours, not ours, his. In the account of David, the Old Testament's filled with accounts like these, but this is a good illustration, we're familiar with it. In the account of David and Goliath, those who were relying on their own strength weren't jumping onto the battlefield, they were fleeing from Goliath, weren't they? Those were the ones relying on their own strength. But David was in step with God's will all along, the whole time, receiving his help at every move. David was skilled, David was wise, but he did not win that battle on his own strength. David gave credit to God because he knew that battle was hopeless without him. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 uh, I'll just reference the teaching of that passage. We are, when we are aware of our own weaknesses, we are wise to then rely on the strength of our Lord to work in and through us to accomplish victory. Um, our, our daily battles with temptation are so serious. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us to draw near to Christ in our time of need. And certainly when we're tempted, that is a time of need. Spiritual strategies for victory. Here we go. Practical ways to be actively faithful. Point one, give up. What does that mean? <laughs> Every victorious journey starts and includes this step. Give up. Now, we're not saying not do anything. But what does this mean spiritually? Again, let's look at David. Remember, he picked up the stones he swung the sling and ultimately wielded Goliath's own sword. He did the work that God blessed. Oh, but that's the key. In all of this, in his heart and in his mind, he was fully yielded or surrendered to God. Here's a bonus verse. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, 12. Let your eyes glance at that and reference it later. It lets us know we are in a battle with forces too strong for us. So our intellect, our strength can't slay the devious giants of life. But you know what? God can. God can and he will help. He promises that if we want that. So God does get the glory while we share in the honor. So give up. Point two, walk in God's presence. The next bonus verse is chapter 6, verse 13 of Ephesians. Verse 13. In this passage, Paul begins to explain, or I should say he helps us suit up in the armor of God and then explains the spiritual purpose of each piece. But I think it's in verse 18 that he reminds us to not set one foot onto that battlefield before we have prayed. Prayed for what? Well, staying alert to the presence of God. That helps us pray for sure. And then also praying or petitioning for his presence to be with you at every step of the journey. You're focused on truth. And that actually helps prevent enemy attack. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. 
It says, pray without ceasing. I did hear a good quote that it says, if we could see what happens when we pray, we would not cease from praying. So keep on praying. That does help minimize the allurement of the temptation and its strength. Point three, in that prayer, give thanks. How, how can giving thanks minimize the temptation to sin? No matter how intense the fight within your own soul, it is a disciplined character that expresses gratitude for salvation in any circumstance and focuses on all the blessings that God has and currently is giving and the promises that he continues to give. All of this helps us fight off things like discontentment, selfishness, and pity, greed, covetousness, and all these things. These are all sins within themselves. But once the devil gets you to that plateau, he then uses those I just mentioned as tools to tempt you with pride to further give in to sin. He is so clever. So count your blessings. Stay appreciative for all that God has done, and this will help you stay strong in the fight. Point four, regarding truth, stay in contact with God's Word. Stay in conscious contact through God's Word. You can't fight evil if you don't know truth. You'll be deceived by the evil. So, in this case, in the case of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, beginning his ministry, teaches us by example, we can also overcome or resist the devil and make him to flee for a time if we quote scripture and quote it accurately for daily living. God's very word in, in relation to battle against evil, truth helps us, but it is also our offensive weapon. Truth <laughs> offends those who oppose it. Truth is our offensive weapon. And God's very word helps us in this. God, in Ephesians 6, describes the armor of God. And I love lessons. I love studies that, that address this. We all, it's natural for each of us to be enthralled with the descriptions of each piece. And as we make comparisons to the Roman guard and what they would have seen each piece do. That, that's a great lesson in and of itself. But, but I came across some research. I've always questioned about some things anyway. So this is a list that came across my study. And I want to share this with you. If you're interested as well in this, then I would say go to uh, uh, this lesson again and just enjoy the study on your own time. Here are some bonus notes. I want you to take note of where we find God's armor. Now, when I'm pointing to this, I'm not implying that the power is in the ink on the paper. What I am referring to is the power of the word of the, the deity of God and his mind, his will, his purpose, and everything that empowers us to live righteously. All right, so I'm pointing to this for that reason. Where do we find the belt of truth? It's found in God's word, John 17, 17. Where do we find the breastplate of righteousness? Well, it is fitted on us by or through the God-breathed Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Where do we find the shoes of the gospel of peace? In the word of truth, Colossians 1, 5. Interesting. Where do we find the shield of faith? It is forged in the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Where do we find the helmet of salvation? It's found in the sacred writings that come from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The Bible is not just a paperweight and a filing cabinet, a catch-all filing cabinet. It is where we find God's own armor to wear and to wield to make sure we are victorious. So take it with you wherever you go. On that note... <laughs> What are you packing as you travel? Pack the right bags, I thought about saying. And I thought, you can take the right bags, but what's inside the bags? Pack the right tools and take the right bags. All right. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, Make no provision for the sins of the flesh. Ooh, wow. The phrase making provision is like a word picture for packing the right bags for a trip. You have think about supplies, you have to think about expenses, where you're going, the time you leave, food, arrangement, transport, lodging, itinerary. You have a lot of things to think about when you travel. 
pack the right bags as you travel through life. It means setting, setting yourself up properly. But in regards to sin, he says, don't pack your bags in preparation for sin. How many times have we done that, either by what we do or don't do? We're allowing it. We're not fighting against it. We know the places that we're going, the things that we might have opportunities to do. And are we setting ourselves up to sin? Here are just a couple examples, and I'm careful about the wording of this. If greed and poor stewardship are your current weaknesses, I would discourage you to go through Vegas, just detour, or to any gas station alone, all right? If natural desires of the flesh are sinfully offsetting your spiritual walk, and don't fool yourself if they are, sin does that, don't use a computer in a closed room. Consider safely throwing it out a 10-story window. Emphasized for the point. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 explains that if we invest in this world, we will be destroyed. If we invest in godly things, we will experience eternal life. So pack your bags to travel with the Spirit. And on that note... What do you do if you have something that's just dead weight, you know, like a runner on a marathon? I don't need this. It's weighing me down. What do I do? Get rid of it. Avoid it. Cut it off. Cut it out. Matthew 5, 29 through 30 says, if your hand or eye causes you to sin, cut it off and pluck it out. I don't mind to read articles based on people's um, study and insight as to whether or not this was literal or a state of hyperbole. I, I enjoy studying, but let's not forget the point. Salvation is more important. So wisely avoid or get rid of anything in your life causing you to sin. Anything? might mean getting new friends, to say the least. Find a fellow traveler. Find a fellow traveler. It does seem that people are more interested in, and it's, why, it's clever for the devil to develop this pride to do this, but it seems like people care more about defending who they are than committed to improving who they are. And the church or every congregation should encourage growth, prodding one another, encouraging one another to do good works. That's another lesson for another time. But Christians are souls that have accepted the call to walk righteously. Okay? Christians, you, it's good to be in your presence because I know you're in this line. You've accepted the call to walk righteously. Yet, all Christians have that internal struggle that we just mentioned. That internal struggle of who do I please? Ooh, that's a temptation. One reason, or, whether it's in thought, in word, or in deed, this is a temptation. Oh boy, what do I do? And the fact that we struggle, take comfort from this, the fact that we struggle shows that we do care about God or else there'd be no conflict. So I'm encouraged by that. But the conflict of interest is what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 7. Who does he give credit to towards the end in chapter 8? Credit to God, God through Christ. And referencing Solomon, I'll reference Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12. Solomon said, two are better than one. They have more success for their labor. They have greater comfort, better protection against attack and help when they fall. I know that it is sadly very difficult to know who to trust, even within the church directory. Because not everyone in a church directory, and only God knows, but it's a fact across the board, not everyone on a church directory it doesn't mean that you're secured in heaven's name and heaven's lips book of life. So I know it's difficult to know who to trust. Christians are not to be lone soldiers, and that's challenging when you feel like you are, but with patience and prayer, wisely seek out those particularly matured Christians who can help you stay strong and not fall. And as you're doing this, there is a, a discipline, a skill that you will develop, and that is point eight, bring the inside out. James chapter five, verse 16 instructs us to share our spiritual struggles with those faithful few who we know and we trust. 
literal confession. I'm thinking about this. This is God's way. Literal confession loosens the snare of temptation. And those supportive prayers can help free and heal you. Wow. So when temptation hits, call those that you've grown closer to. And that does take time, so start right now if you haven't. Those, well, let me reword this on the spot. That alone can help uh, diffuse the, the, the temptation and also reduce its power. Oak Hill would be so tremendously blessed if each one of us commit to that. And I hope that you commit to that. And here's something else. As you're focusing on all this, as you're pursuing righteousness, instead of thinking about yourself, which is sin is selfish for the most part, guess what happens after that? You're doing things that promote goodness. Oh, what a beautiful world it would be if people spend their time doing good things, acts of service and love in their heart. I mean, here's a quote. In the hearts of the selfish, sin wins. In the heart of the selfish, sin wins. So... Make it hard for temptation to catch up with you. In the example of Jesus, the humble Lord, run the righteous race by being a servant of others. If you can do anything at all, you will never be able to say, I'm bored. Overwhelmed in other things, that's understandable, but, but Lord helps with that too. You will never be bored because you're motivated to continue being an answer to other people's prayers. That's great. And then tenth and last in this short list, do the next right thing. Do the next right thing. Matthew 6, we know it well. God's kingdom, his righteousness, seek those things first. Not a time principle, but it is a governing principle. In all that you do, seek God's will over it all. That's beautiful. Let his uh, righteousness rule your heart. Be careful. <clears throat> To not get overwhelmed when thinking about a lifelong faithful walk. A lot of people do. I can't do that. Whoa, whoa. Who's the, who's the subject of that sentence again? We're not talking about us. Our loving Father sees our desire to please Him and our efforts to simply do the next right thing. We are developed as we grow. We are developed as we go. But the Christian life is simply one step at a time. Taking that next right step at a time. And then you look at how far you've come and what you've gone through and what you've overcome. And what do you do? You do just like David. You say, praise God for what he's done in my life. As the perfect father, he reminds us to always be watchful. Always be mindful of new ways that the devil is trying to adapt and upgrade his program to tempt you to sin. Follow these steps, use these spiritual tools, and just stand back and watch God and praise him for the great spiritual uh, victories in your life, the spiritual triumphs that you will experience. Uh, victory comes in two ways. Victory over temptation comes in two stages. One, you resisted. Congratulations, that's a victory. Yes. Good. James 4, 7. As time goes on, as time goes on in the Lord, your heart has been refined, and you can say this or that doesn't tempt me anymore. Victory. Matthew 6, 33 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. But don't think you're standing lest you fall. <laughs> On your own, that is. Don't lower your shield. Satan's upgrading his systems. He's figuring out new ways to tempt you. God allows this to help us grow, but the devil's intent's not good. Suit up with the armor of God. And I will conclude our lesson today with... Predominantly the reading of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Is there a weakness in your armor, the ones that you've been wearing? Put on the whole armor of God today, people. Take sin seriously, take the Lord serious. And walk that righteous race of life for righteousness sake. The devil will tempt you even this afternoon. Are you ready? Are you in Christ? If not, let's make it happen as we stand in the